Hi, this is Ashishat Bedekar and welcome to my podcast, The ARB Show. I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest, Moshala. She is the CEO of Slash Data. Slash Data, as you might know, is the leading analyst firm in the developer economy, tracking global software developer trends via the largest, most comprehensive developer surveys worldwide. Their research helps the top technology firms understand who developers are, what tools they're using, and where they are going next. Welcome to the show, Moshala. Do share more about your life journey and your vision for Slash Data. Over to you. Sure. And and just to be uh just to be fully open and transparent, and my name is pronounced Moskula. Moskula. So, oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. So if someone else watches it, they know it's pronounced Moskula. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's pronounced most cool. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. So thank you for having me, Ashish. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, I'm, I, I mean, the journey where I come from, what I've done is, is actually a little bit different, I think maybe, but normal for my culture and where I come from. So uh, I grew up in a small town in Indiana in the United States. Um, my family, however, is Greek and, and American since uh, myself and my siblings were born in the U.S. They owned a restaurant. This is a very common thing for Greek Americans in the, <laughs> in the U.S. and living there. Um, but uh, when I was about 15, my family decided to move back to Greece. So I've spent the majority of my life now in Europe versus the US. Um, in university, I studied international business and European public policy. I, you know, I interned for a couple orgs in Athens and Brussels, and I worked for a variety of, inter- of industries uh, from alternative energy uh, to uh, sustainable, sustainable orgs. So dealing about around sustainable development, food commodities, uh, fintech, and the last now seven years, I've been in developer market research. So um, something I want to talk about, you, you asked about the vision for Slash Data, right? So the vision for Slash Data is, uh, you know, developing from where we are, never staying still. <laughs> We've been moving a lot in the last uh, few years. I took over as CEO It's now been about two and a half years. Um, Slash Data has historically been quantitative uh, research company that focus on developers that has mainly been serving major tech orgs. Um, You know, we produce a series of reports and companies could subscribe to it, um, to trends on the ecosystem uh, about the developer landscape. Now we're doing a lot more bespoke research. Um, We still have a lot of subscriptions and that's going strong, but we run a lot of surveys um, and research for orgs to their own communities. Um, Some one organization might have a developer community they want to understand more or dig into or run some specific study. Um, uh, So we would facilitate that. At the same time, we also field surveys for them. So we have a developer, the developer nation community. It's a developernation.net. Um, those listening can visit and developers come through there, get join the community. And then through that network, we ask them tons of questions and run surveys to them. So we create custom reports based on any existing research. We'll do segmentation projects, a lot of um, a lot of customers can just send questions and we query the community, right? So really just a quick response. We're uh, doing some strategic decision making, some planning. We help them get the information they need. But what we would really like to do and what we're already started doing, we're doing a lot more qualitative work, possibly focus groups, um, doing secondary competitive market research. So just not even waiting to collect the data. There's so much data out there and information out there understanding the landscape. We recently um, published a a study that's out there sort of creating a a benchmarking across the offering for um, AI orgs, for example. We have that available that's not using data that's going out there and saying, what is the offering for the the top silicon vendors out there? So um, for especially for the the uh, the AI space. So we have a, a number of things that we're working on right now. 
fantastic fantastic and uh, you know uh, as you rightly mentioned when you know, companies big tech companies are or even small startups when they were they build developer tools or uh, one of the biggest problems or biggest challenges which uh, anyone faces is what is the kind of key tips or what are the kind of pricing strategy or what are the things to be to consider and uh, it would be great if you can throw some light or share your insights on that uh, topic essentially the top 3 tips for developer tools pricing uh, i think that would be very relevant and uh, very insightful for the audience uh, i invite you uh, over to you yeah thanks yeah this is a topic i i i feel slash data has put a lot more emphasis on lately and it's it's gotten a lot of sort of request by our our customers themselves some of those very large companies trying to understand how to optimize their pricing strategy and so um what we had done is we created a small report and I'll I'll, say, I'll share the link with you um that was trying to clarify a little bit and give some you know quick wins to the to the to those interested we interviewed um people in in um devrel and in marketing and in product management to get to know you know those bigger challenges that they they need help with and one of those topics because it was pricing strategy we decided to focus on that and produce this this little report um and and one of the big questions was you know what makes developers move from free versions to paid versions um and and this is this is really what we're talking about in the study So one of the things um so going to the top things to think about that we uh that we we realized is that um what we should understand the answer to why developers buy and invest in a tool in the first place. Um one of the biggest reasons for a developer to buy or a tool or use a paid version is, is very clearly to increase their productivity. they care about their productivity very deeply and if you are creating a, a marketing campaign or if you're creating the the content information to get and build your case productivity is definitely an argument that you should be discussing so um that will definitely help you if you are not mentioning productivity Uh, and how what your service your product your offering your tool is and how it's going to help them be more productive it may not be attractive enough right go, go um if yeah if you have a free version and the developer is already seeing that things are faster easier smoother less stress for them to 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 finish a task or uh, within their workflow then it's going to help you very much Very, very, um, very, that's that's i think a very relevant point because uh, even when you talk of saas or any such uh, mm-hmm. offering the biggest uh, biggest challenge is how do you convert uh, from freemium to paid so uh, so you know that's that's a, a pretty uh, important challenge do you see any specific distinctions within uh, various tools or this uh, specific challenge is only in let's say a certain set of tools like ai or so uh, for example mm-hmm. there could be some sectors in which there is more uh, free uh, kind of more free tier compared to paid uh, and there could be some sectors where you have seen more, uh, you know relative ease of uh, developers adopting you know premium subscription so any any insights or any slides or any information which you would like to share uh, as as a uh, as an insight yeah um what i probably lean into actually i can't share it says share host disabled screen sharing so if you if you're able to um open that up i i'm happy to share a slide just to give you a little bit more insight on that um yeah, can you try now it says i've enabled uh yeah, yeah i'm able to now so i'm going to yeah. go straight to the slide So just to give you a little bit more insight there um here. So just looking at the motivations um this is how much of a difference and how much productivity matters compared to everything else right So 
it's a it's a big difference here and and improving quality of code is is probably second but it's a huge gap there so this is even how far so i wanted to lean into that before i moved into the next topic um the next thing i would think about and and probably i'll lean into the the the, the next you know thing to think about here is to know your customer you leaned into it very well you asked about is there a specific type of tool that this matters more um, the data that we have doesn't really lean too much into doesn't prove that we have we could dig more into like if it's an iot um uh, is there more uh, is there a difference between iot developer or an uh an ai developer or someone who identifies as is is working heavily in the front end and web um what we saw however does make a big difference is also um um, their the size of company, uh, their location, culture. Um, so we'll go into um, know your customer. This is probably the big thing to know. Know your customer. Um, who are the developers you're targeting? What do you know about them? Pros are reacting different than non-pros. We can identify that. Um, their motivations are different. So the more you know about them, the better. And we can even look at, and maybe this is something of an interesting project. If someone is interested in this data, we could definitely look into it for them. Especially in this data set, we had quite a few, you know, more than five here. The, the sample was about all nearly 600 developers. So if we ask and we, we dig into the data and see, are there any variances or what happens, what changes in the type of industry they're in? That's also very interesting. There's a, a number of data cuts in the report already, but I want to focus on a few. So um, the bread and butter at Slash Data is about helping customers, uh, helping our company, our customers understand who developers are, um, who their customers are, but also who their non-customers are. So also identifying, you know, who is the target audience, but who are you not capturing? And then understanding how they make those decisions is probably going to be important as well. Um, if you are uh, developing a new tool before you make the decisions on developing your pricing model, it might be a good idea to collect the data if you don't have it, look at reports like this, or um, find a way to, to, to get the data. So I mentioned um, region might be a factor here. Uh, we identified uh, region culture, the type of company they work for, um, the level of experience seemed to be an important thing. So how senior they are and we can understand why. Um, and what their role is will make a difference in their buying decision. I don't mean if they buy or not, I'm saying in even the type of, of payment cycle they prefer, right? So even it goes there as well. Got it. And, and I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so another point to consider for companies is to also maybe look at the geographical spread of uh, of developers. So let's say they're targeting a specific technology or a specific platform. Uh, do you also have data which, uh, which kind of gives you some insight as to what's the kind of concentration of developers? Are they in Asia or are they in Europe yes. or are they in North America? So based on yes. that, the company or startup needs to you know refine their uh, outreach or go to market plans so maybe yes. this, this kind of goes in sync with you know uh, knowing more about your customers i also like what you mentioned about specifically also understanding who are the non customers because mm. uh, because many a times in technology because tools or uh, you know platforms etc can uh, can be used by many uh, people or many customers for various reasons and especially if you are uh, you have a lot of uh, free customers that really kind of clouds the uh, you know clouds the market but if you have a very clear understanding of what who is your uh, non customer that uh, really gives an example could you share some insight of of companies who maybe using your insights were able to understand who are not uh, non customers and that and how they kind of refined uh, you know their their gtm or their pricing you know that would help yeah right. so what's interesting that's a really good question because the recently we were, we did um, another internal size orgs 
um, what information they really need and they, they don't have available. So one thing that did come up with is startups looking for really um, clear TAM sizing. How many of these developers exist? Where are they in the world? And, and that is something that um, we do quite a bit. What's interesting is understanding the non-customers. So we, we do a lot of benchmarking and we do sort of for developer programs and we'll look at um, the top you know 20 or so vendors and we're talking to Google, Microsoft, um, the silicon vendors, Intel, Nvidia, et cetera. And we'll look at you know how their developers are ranking a lot of their resources. But then we can also identify, well, what are you doing within that company? What are you doing? What are you using? How, what are you accessing resources for? And what are you building? And we, we look at, you know, th there's a huge interest in, okay, what are the developers saying about our non, those not using our tools, those that are not using and accessing our resources, what are they saying? And kind of coming to us and uh, trying to understand why developers will be more satisfied with a competitive offering. So we've done um, a lot of that with a certain product area. We look into um, what was a, a recent, so we do a lot with CI CD tools in the DevOps space. And we'll look at, you know, what are, what are the decision-making drivers that would push someone to use one tool over another? Um, and who is making that decision as well as important if it's at the developer level, if it's at the team lead level, if it's at a CTO level, for example, and then that's kind of explored as well. Um, but people that we should be listening to our non-customers, we, and that's kind of where I'm getting at the end of the day is if I, they are not coming through me, this is, in, and I have my own developer community. I have my own customer base. I have ways of collecting that information myself, but you need a third party, whether it be Slash data or through somewhere else, um, you need a third party to understand the, those that are not using your tools. So why are they going to my competitors? What are my the developers that are using my competitors but have trialed my solution? What are they saying about my solution? If they trialed my solution, why did they not stay? Why did they leave? Why did they reject? So understanding the full, you know, anyone that has interacted with your solution is important. If you're a startup and you are able to identify, obviously your new tool, you're not, you're not out there. You need to go out there and understand what everyone is saying about your competitors, your potential competitors and, and their experiences with them. Got it. So uh, would I be right in saying that, uh, you know, is that helpful? Does that answer? Very, very, Sorry. very. Much. <laughs> I mean, in fact, I can fact, go it's... on. No, no, that that's fine. So in fact, in many cases, you know, the, the if you kind of focus on basics, you know, it, it kind of makes, uh, you know, life much more easy. So I was just uh, mentioning that uh, there are tools uh, like built with, which kind of for a specific website or so kind of uh, highlight the various backend tools or backend uh, systems which are there to, to give a very rough analogy. Maybe it may not be 100% correct, but just just like uh, built with gives you an understanding of the a website. Similarly, uh, if a company knows that the target audience, what are the kind of typical uh, set of tools, typical set of platforms which they are using, and what's the role of their specific offering into that wider basket of things that, and that mm -hmm. kind of uh, correlation, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, that really would help the company understand, okay, you know, the, these are the kind of uh, cohort, if I may use the word, of other uh, com complementary tools uh, or complementary platforms, which if the developers are using, makes sense for them to use my tool, right? Or something like that. So that, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, analytical thinking, well, I, like you mentioned, yeah. would be very relevant. Yeah. Excellent. And and it's not even, it's also the, what is the gap that's not being filled? Got it. That I can take over. I can yeah. break into as well. So the, the why someone is rejecting a platform could, or, or a tool or an offering, could be a, an opening for for someone else to come in and and really take over that that space um yeah 
for sure. Great. And and what would be your final point or final tip uh, in this journey of pricing or pricing discovery or best practice? Yeah. Yeah, I think I had I had one more thing just to think about. I kind of leaned into the billing cycle. So, let's say you're here, you understand the size of your market, you understand that you 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 collected the TAM, you know how big they are. Um, you know your competitive landscape, right? So going into that, but coming back to even how you develop a pricing strategy, um, the billing cycle matters. And I thought that was really, really interesting in the data. I wanted to point that out that when you are, you know, and, and again, I we we deal with very large companies most of the time, and but they tend to have, you know, if you think of a really big company, they are like a big group of startups. Every time they build a new tool, a new offering, and they branch up, it's like having another startup within the big company that is just, they have, they don't have to run, they don't have to collect funding, they don't need to have to rate fundraise and get money, but at, at the same, but it's like running a startup within an org. So, they need to understand and as well and learn well what is the ideal billing cycle as well should this be a weekly monthly quarterly annually um billing cycle and even that uh has, was was a bit different and i think i'll just share again am i sharing right okay so i think it's this here so um, developers and small businesses, they show a higher inclination towards annual, which I thought was the reverse. If you're a smaller company, you have less funding, maybe that's a struggle. Um, but those within uh, larger companies will lean towards as well more uh, uh, monthly, right? So large enterprises also have the monthly more a little bit more than annually. So there's there's a, a high inclination overall for the monthly, but then annually, if you're a smaller company, you're more likely to prefer a, an annual billing cycle than um, than your larger counterparts. So I thought that was interesting, a little bit different. Very very Isn't interesting. It's a bit of a jump between them. True. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, on Prima Fisa, it might look paradoxical, but now uh, since I uh, think about it. It actually makes sense because if you look at startups, right, they have a limited budget. And if the tool is really so important for business, it makes sense to have a longer, you know, commit for a long time. So you don't have to worry about uh, about it again and your business is not impacted. Maybe that could be yes. one reason why they kind of say, OK, this is important. Let's allocate. Sure. Let's, exactly. You know, let's let's move it out of the thing. And uh, if you look at big companies, right, uh, mega companies, all of them live on a quarter to quarter cycle, right? So, so depending, depending on the kind of thing, if the, to if the tool or the platform is really uh, very costly, uh, if they kind of break it into uh, chunks in the quarter, that becomes much more manageable than, you know, sudden spike in, uh, in, uh, in one, one year and then uh, sudden drop. Yeah. Makes and even the monthly was quarterly is the least prefer. Yeah. Which was, which was really surprising to me. Like if you have an annual subscription and I don't think, you know, I think most companies don't want to have monthly subscription models anymore. It's, it's, it's a lot because your sales cycle is, it doesn't last as long and you have to renew every month. And that, that's a huge cost for any small company to always have that sales team available to renew or, or to push the renewal. But, but, you know, what becomes more interesting, obviously, is focus on the stickiness of your product. How much is this really necessary for your customer's business? And something I, I heard, you know, we've read Many of us probably have read the Lean Startup, and he said something that really hit me. I, I um, at some point, and it was, um, you know, focus on the problem you're trying to solve. But the main, the way he said it, um, was really like, um, has your customer, or does your customer, realize this is their problem? Ahead of like before you come in and tell them the solution, does your customer even know this is a problem? True. And are they actively seeking for a solution to solve it? True. And so that will clarify how sticky your product is. Got it. Got it. Right. No, in, in fact, the third point was kind of the aha moment. Uh, and it also kind of brings in the value of a third party 
or a research uh, player like slash data to to kind of put light on these such information nuggets which because you know in in the in the corporate world or so people are so busy driving business or things like that uh, these are some kind of real gems which uh, you know probably get overlooked and and let's the let's say the people who are deciding on let's say the pricing Uh, they they are not uh, they don't appreciate this finer nuances which you just brought out of a annual versus a monthly billing cycle they say we know we know by experience uh, you know if it's a big company uh, annual uh, license is the way to go and uh, for startups let's have a day pass or a week pass but your research shows that that's not the case you know it's important to have a open mind yeah and it's not preferred exactly yeah. So great thank you so much this gives a great perspective and uh, thank you dear listeners for tuning in uh, do subscribe share and like this podcast consider giving the podcast a five star rating if you like the content bye for now talk to you soon